Asperger. Within this talk, I plan to illustrate the discourse of photographing animals within the wild compared to captivity. I will highlight whether photographing animals within captivity can be classed and accepted as a form of wildlife photography, but I will also explore the strengths and weaknesses within both forms of photography. So, what does being a wildlife photographer include? In the Practical Manual of Captive Animal Photography, it states for most it is people who are interested in wildlife and spend their time travelling around the world photographing creatures within the wild. The Essential Wildlife Photography Manual expresses how there is much more to this style of photography and that it is about taking a photograph of animals in as natural an environment as possible, but it is also about making more than just a mere record and showing how an animal is significant behaviour and interactions. A wildlife photographer needs to be a naturalist. They need to be able to learn about their subjects, the creature's habits, the dangers they face every day within nature, and furthermore, they need to be aware of the dangers as humans have added to the species and their environments. It is a form of photography which teaches the artist to be patient and prepared. The statement at the beginning of this introduction already shows how wildlife photography is seen as photographing the wildlife and non-domesticated an animals. But the question is, does this include animals within captivity? If you look into the works of George Wheelhouse, if you look into the works of George Wheelhouse, who believes photographing within captivities like zoos maximizes his shooting opportunities. In addition, are the photographers who believe it is better to photograph animals within captivity because the creatures are used to being around humans as opposed to creatures within the wild, which can easily be startled or frightened by the presence of another photographer. But when exploring Richard Jashinsky's work, body of work, Zoo, which even though it has been captured within captivity, it shows the darker side of zoos. However, this project is still an example of an artistic piece of work created within captivity. Other ways to analyse what wildlife photography entails are to look at the debates between these photographers, such as the discourse of photographing animals within the wild, in, within the wild compared to captivity. An appropriate place to start with this will be to briefly define, define the two forms. Wildlife photography is a type of photography that focuses on photographing wildlife or non-domesticated animals, and is something you need a lot of patience for. Photographing within captivity still involves photographing different species, however this, their environment, environment will be man-made and will be within zoos and sanctuaries. This behaviour will not be as natural in comparison to what, would, what it would be within the wild due to human presence. An interesting example to start off with is the 2012 National Geographic Photo Contest in which photographer Ashley Vincent won her, with her photograph called The Explosion. This depicts a tiger that shakes herself dry. However, this caused controversy with other wildlife photographers, such as Brandon Van Sun, who felt, and I quote, insulted and disappointed, and how National Ge Geographic is saying that we don't really need photographers out there in the wild, and that we can just go to zoos to obtain our wildlife images. He also comes to mention how this is offensive to the National Geographic's wildlife photographers because when they are working out in the field, they will spend entire days hiding out and often endangering their lives trying to capture naturally beautiful images. This is not the first time this has happened. Back in 2010, a photographer was stripped of his prestigious wildlife award because he had photographed a wolf in captivity, but it stated the image was captured within the wild. But here's where we can see the issue. Um, the difference with the 2012 winner, Ashley Vincent, is that she had stated her image was taken within captivity. And her thoughts on the matter, even though she knows some people feel captive animal photography is inferior to photographing animals within the wild, she believes images that capture the subject's character and personality are engaging and that it could play a part in protecting and conserving what she calls Mother Nature's gifts. One of the issues that has been touched upon is honesty within wildlife photographs and the incident where in 2010 Jose Luis Rodriguez, winner of the Viola Environment Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award, was stripped of his prestigious prize due to stating his image 
was that of a rare, a rare wild wolf, but was soon discovered through evidence and investigations that this wolf was a captive animal. This leads me to try and discuss what the truth within photography is. In Leslie Mullins' Truth in Photography, Perception, Myth and Reality in the Postmodern World, we learn that originally photography was considered as a way to objectively represent reality, completely untouched by the photographer's perspective. All art forms manipulate reality in order to reveal the truths, not apparent to the uncritical eye. The understanding of the photographic truth comes from an understanding of culture, belief, history and the understanding of human nature which for wildlife photographers, when it comes to representing the species and understand, an understanding of said species, their habitat, behaviours, mating and eating habits needs to be made for them to depict them correctly and as truthfully as possible. From this understanding, it is clear to see why Rodriguez was stripped of his award as he misled the truth. It was not bad that the image was taken within captivity. What was wrong was how he led his viewers to believe it had been taken within the wild. But why do we photograph animals? If we look into John Berger's, Berger's Why Look at Animals, a historical, which is a historical preface where it stated how animals were first seen as messages, promises, metaphors, and how ancient stories are filled with animal imagery. Then moving thousands of years into the future in which animals were seen as machines because they had no souls compared to as humans. They were then seen as just commodities and as a raw material. But then he looked into domesticated animals and how they were kept regardless of their usefulness. However, later into this book, he starts to argue about how zoos are a place of disappointment where the animals are not animals and do not act the way they are supposed to. Chester Zoo would disagree with this theory as they state it is easier to research on animals' behaviours within captivity as they can be difficult to study within their natural habitat and most research that has been conducted on animals' behaviours have mostly all been recorded within a captive situation. So it is arguable that when photographing animals within zoos, some zoos, that their behaviours are most likely natural. The practical manual of captive animal photography states how captive animal photography is when you can work with an animal that is free, mo free roaming and that captive species are mis much more accustomed to humans. Photographing within zoos and nature centres are one of the solutions to ethical problems photographers face when photographing wild animals. A great positive of captive and wildlife photography is how it can help conservation projects a great, and a great example of this would be Joel Stoll's current work, Photo Arc, in which he photographed captive animals within a studio setting, which was all for a good cause to show the world the decrease of certain endangered species before they're gone from the world for good. It is a great example of how photography can emphasise conservation efforts. However, there are some issues photographers can face when photographing within zoos such as natural backgrounds and low lighting conditions. Animal photography states how the photographer is a naturalist and their camera is a visual notebook in which they can record a species during the trip. A huge positive is the travelling and the opportunity to photograph an animal within their natural environment. And for photographers like Steve Bloom, who strive to capture the animal's spirit and blur the lines separating different species. One of the negatives within wildlife photography is ethics and how some of the photographers have put the image before the animal safety. An article uh, focusing on wildlife mentions the Slender Loris case in which the photographer paid the indigenous canny community to arrange for the Loris photo shoots even though the community has beliefs of bad luck towards it and sadly, the capture at times involved cutting down the trees or branches to photograph the animal. There is no way for me to determine whether captive animal photography will ever be fully accepted by all wildlife photographers, but I hope this has given insight into how there is no fully true way to photograph animals. Both captive and wildlife photographers can be deceitful. Um, and I think it could be more widely accepted if they were more honest. Thank you very much, Kylie. Um, I think it's really interesting that you showed that Steve Bloom picture. 
Um, what is your opinion on photographers kind of going in and, in, like, quote, invading their um, kind of habitat and just kind of getting in there? Um, well, I think obviously it's, of course, up to the photographer what they do. If they choose to go and disturb an animal, then obviously that's very wrong. And I totally disagree with it. I think you shouldn't have to disturb an animal just to obtain um, just to obtain an, an image. Like some animals, especially barn animals, if they're nesting, it is illegal to disturb them or photograph them while they're nesting. You have to have certain licenses, which are very hard to obtain. Yeah. Uh, so do you feel it's better to be uh, wildlife photography uh, where you're from afar and not the southern room or to actually go into these um, active places and actually get to know these animals um, and things like that you know, until they're not? Um, well, I think it all depends. I think there are some animals in which the wild which you can approach and can actually be quite comfortable with you approaching them. But if you're causing the animal too much stress, I think it is best to stay away and with modern technology, a lot of cameras nowadays, zoom lenses and telephoto lenses, you shouldn't have to need to get that up close to the animal in the first place. One for yourself and two for them. And, but I think zoos are really helpful as well. I think they're more helpful for people, one, who enjoy it, to, um, to emphasise conservation efforts, but also it's great to practise skills there as well, if you are a bit in wildlife photographer. You mentioned um, like photographing in captivity helps to sort of document them in their natural forms because it's easy to approach them. But does it know them? Because are they really in their natural forms in captivity? Because they're used to the human presence and animals shouldn't be used to that things. See, in my beliefs, like, and I'm quite a big animal lover, I think we were all on this planet. We were all born on this planet, and I think there shouldn't be any harm for animals to be used to us. It's the same as documenting humans. You're gonna get some humans who are gonna be very comfortable with you photographing them, and you're gonna get some who are like, no, I don't wanna be photographed. It's the same in wildlife. Even animals within zoos aren't always comfortable with being photographed up front, but they are because they are used to human nature. It's like having your dog around, but they're still a valuable place because not all zoos, but most zoos do try and help the animals and as I said before, a lot of their behaviour. That is documented in even books is actually documented in captivity.